second delay. Hmm. good that looks good that looks very good
and we are live i think it all seems so well so hello there folks my name is Damazy Podsiadło i am streaming to you from Lower Silesia Poland city of Wałbrzych i am a military historian i am living here in my apartment on covid quarantine with my wife and marie right there right now there is no I, I i don't have my dog with me but he will be very important hero to these shows sometimes i hope uh, now well a word about me since this is the first show i was always told why i don't have a youtube channel any stream any channel any anything to share you know history because uh, a lot of people in know me uh, to talk about history like a lot i am quite monothematic about that uh, man, however often you see me in a bar talking with friends i am probably you know talking about some history stuff i am reading right now or wrote lately or something like that or just you know part of history that fascinated me um, and i want to you know get it out of my system uh, i also had a lot of um, guest lectures on conventions on uh, some sometimes i was even paid <laughs> to do to do history lectures however i am not professional historian i was um i studied history i started uh, history studies at university of wrocław my alma mater in 2006 i believe and and finished and graduated well 2010 2011 i defended my masters 2012 uh, and that was masters from, from second world war and german tanks actually my um, my promoter uh was making fun of us because there were like three of us making uh, masters from the similar topics of tanks of, so from from second world war so yes i am quite a generic boy when it comes to uh, my historical uh, interests however since uh, i never stopped studying history that is uh, that is the thing i never mm, at least that's how i think about my historical studies i never finished that actually i am still studying i am still um, learning new stuff and at some point i think you just want to share it at some sorts so this is this youtube channel is attempt at exactly doing so you will get me live i am not recording that be before there is like five second delay between me saying and you hearing uh, so please be understanding and this is my first time <laughs> uh, and so without further ado let's let's jump to our first show and yes this is history over beer i am in a pub and we are drinking beer today i have książęce ipa india pale ale or their attempt at india pale ale not a bad beer to be honest, I remember old książęce was very bad. And this is local beer, actually, from Silesia. So, if you like it, well, then you like it. If you're not, then you probably have a good taste. Uh, anyway. First show. We're gonna talk about Polish cavalry. Why there was cavalry? Is uh, were Polish, you know, backwards and stupid uh, for, you know, fielding cavalry units in 20th century, 1939. They charged tanks, right? With lances and sabers. Well, no, they didn't actually. But was it the near fact, the bare fact of having cavalry units in 20th century uh, a proof of stupidity of Polish? Well, that was actually Soviet propaganda and German propaganda during the war uh, saying that because you know of course it's changing thanks and it's not true <laughs> to, to simply put the short answer is not true it's full of bullshit uh, because there was a very good reason polish head cavalry and in this show i will try to answer it for you why there was polish cavalry in september 1939 so and we can go back with the uh, with this answer to glorious winged hussars and so but beside that beside polish cavalry traditions uh, that were you know important for 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 polish and, and 
with no doubt a lot of Polish soldiers uh, wanted to go to cavalry because of that cavalry tradition uh, Polish had. So, but that was not even the most important reason. Uh, the most important reason is geography and and its Polish strategy and and also Polish strategy, uh, because Polish saw their enemies on the east. Uh, Germans were not considered enemy of Poland, which is well, you, you can consider it a bad mis strategical mistake, and I would agree. Uh, however, we we started to consider German and enemy. We will fight about 1938, so pretty much um, late. And why we consider? Soviet Union as our main enemy well because we fought them between 1919 and 1921 during that war uh, Polish armed forces had uh, were you know pretty much organized on the fly there were like free military tra traditions because Poland was just you know reinstated as a sovereign state and uh, any soldiers Polish had uh, fought in the first world war before or almost fought or tried to fought or didn't want to fight but but were still in line in in the service with one of three countries that would be uh, Russia um, uh, Russian Empire that would be pra uh, well not Prussia German uh, Germany and Austria Hungary during that war between 1919 and 1921, uh, Polish didn't have enough forces to, you know, to um, have an exact, you know, front line. There were, it was long front. Uh, from north to south, it was uh, at some point, it was a thousand kilometers or, or more than that. We couldn't uh, man that that kind of a long front and and the red army could uh, so and you know always the war in the east when you don't have enough forces to uh, to have a stable front line all the way you need to maneuver you you need to move your forces you need to move them quick between obstacles and and we are and when we are talking eastern eastern european theater of warfare there were no uh, you know many obstacles for for for, for big um, units of of for for big armies for divisions for especially for heavy equipment and um, most of this uh, <clears throat> most of these obstacles natural obstacles were rivers so um, the natural course of operating in the east uh, was jumping from one river crossing to one to another when you are defending that is when you are defending you want to take that crosses you want to defend them you want these were the points your defense is were fixed upon uh, so that's how polish fought in this war they that was war of fire and maneuver and not much uh, first world war uh, positional warfare it was not like that and uh, and at the Eastern Front, even during First World War, it was more mobile front and number of units and, you know, per square meter of front w was much less than on the Western Front. Um, also, second part, why uh, have having cavalry was important, because there were not, 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 in 1920s cars were not reliable enough. Uh, they were good for roads if you have roads and yes this pause is you know kind of critical because if you're slavic you know your roads are shit and i'm not talking any slavic country in particular if you're a slavic person right now living in your country you probably whine about roads a little bit at least a little bit where in 1930s in 1920s it was even worse than that and we're talking about eastern parts of russia uh, western parts of russia no roads, no no hardened roads, uh, no cubical stones, no asphalt. Well, sometimes few of them in minor places. Most long range transport was on rail, and most roads that there were dirt roads. What happens to dirt roads every spring and every autumn? Well, in eastern eastern theater of combat, every spring and every autumn, you have like there there can be you know a lot of raining like a lot of rain 
and Eastern Theater then transforms into Sea of Muck, like mud, a lot of a lot of mud. And you should, and you probably now thinking, if you don't know your Second World War history, Eastern Front, that well, it's it shouldn't be that bad, you know. Polish should have tanks. Tanks can go splendidly through mud. Well, today's tanks, yes, and tanks through uh, from the later part of the war, yes, that they, they, they were kind of good in that. Uh, however, in 1939, uh, most of um, Polish tanks, most of Western tanks, German tanks, and even uh, a lot of Soviet tanks still have very narrow tracks. If you have narrow tracks, uh, mud is still an obstacle enough for tanks for for them to slow down, have difficult have difficulties maneuvering, and so on. Later in the war, like T T thirty four, have much wider tracks, uh, much wider caterpillars. So uh, it was in in that sense, some tanks were better than others. Still, however, even if you're Panzer Spearhead is going 10 kilometers, then you have to, or 15 kilometers, or 20 kilo, or 20 kilometers, you still have to supply them. You still have to supply the people fighting. They need food, they need fuel, they need ammunition, they need, they need spare parts for their tanks. And this, all these spare parts, all this food and fuel were transported by rail, preferably, but uh, some parts on the roads, on these dirt roads, and on, you know, on lorries. And lorries were fucked, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, and if you think I'm full of crap, well, then you don't know your Eastern history front during Second World War, because uh, Germans uh, started the Eastern operation against Russians without having any cavalry units in on the front lines. Uh, I am pretty sure they 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 reformed all their cavalry units into armored units or uh, personal carrier units or armored car squadrons and so on uh, they only had cavalry units from their allies like uh, hungarians romanians italians and they proved autumn during autumn 1941 like after uh, you know this glorious barbarossa campaign when they took like a, more than a million prisoners and so on they slowed down, like they they slowed down very much. Like um, if you read um, commander of the well, later commander and back now uh, commander one of their Panzer regiments, uh, Ernst Strauss, I think uh, he was the commander of six Panzer division later from 1942, I think. Uh, he was commanding a Panzer spearhead of his division in 1941 in the autumn and he and and his elite panzer unit his elite panzer unit veterans of poland and france they could only make like five or six maybe eight kilometers a day like uh, if you compare that to france where rommel could uh, could, could make over 30 kilometers a day so mm, not Blitzkrieg, right? Mud was killing to Blitzkrieg and was ki and, and, and and was killing tanks, actually. Um, the dirt can, you know, very much even during the summertime, the, the dirt that your tracks take in the air uh, can, you know, can damage your engine, can, uh, not to mention uh, it's not comfortable it's very tiring to you know to march in uh, to march or to ride in when there is dust everywhere um, but you know t during the summer uh, all mechanized formations of wehrmacht red army and polish because polish had a few mechanized formations we'll talk them in a moment and um, they were okay during summer they were going splendidly Blitzkrieg, uh, Blitzkrieg, Blitzkrieg style. During autumn, not so much. During winter, even if you have this, you know, this part between autumn and winter, there is already snowing. There is already, you know, uh, low temperatures, but there are a lot of water. That, th these temperatures are not that low, so everything is frozen solid. Not yet. Then your tanks, after riding in mud all day, you leave, you left them. On the night uh, and this mud in below uh, zero celsius temperatures during the night froze solid so every 
morning, even if, if this is not, you know, full time, full scale winter, uh, you still have immobilized tank. And, and so Polish having cavalry is just, you know, the, the answer to that circumstance of combat on the Eastern Front. You Polish wanted a fast maneuvering unit in all seasons and that and only horses only horses could uh, guarantee you that uh, you can move actually more than a few kilometers a day with your weapons uh, with your anti uh, light anti-tank guns and light artillery pieces and so on only horses were capable of moving that and um, and during 1942 like after a first experience of autumn in the east uh, or even in in winter during winter 1941 Germans start uh, resurrecting their cavalry units they took Italian cavalry units Hungarian cavalry units Romanian cavalry units they they overused them during that autumn because they didn't have horses they didn't have enough horses in in frontline units they used horses like a lot however in logistics and uh, there were like millions of horses serving on the Eastern Front with Wehrmacht. Uh, but they start to re reorganize some of the uh, armored units into cavalry units. Or start organizing new cavalry units from infantry units. Because horses were the, still the most reliable form of transportation in the Eastern theater of combat. And, uh, even, and only later during the war you have uh, fully mechanized formations that, that can deal with that to some extent but still uh, soviet army fielded uh, cavalry units with horses so how is that in relation to soviet claims that polish having cavalry were were in prepared for unprepared for war and plainly stupid well that's just not making any sense uh, so Polish were trying to fight enemy in the east that's why we organized cavalry units now what about lances sabers right <laughs> and charging and charging on tanks because we will I will scope into that into one charge in particular that uh, that created this myth we having um, sabers let's start with sabers well thing is melee fighting happened during second world war and especially during first world war and oftentimes um, soldiers found themselves with a hmm, let me take and gather words this sci-fi is not that bad actually Yeah, very good. So, uh, Polish cavalry con uh, cavalrymen often considered themselves elite of Polish armed forces, and they had uh, good reason actually for it. They 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 trained a lot. Uh, there were, you know, re uh, there were actual rewards for doing well on on uh, training, and some of this training actually work was kind of. You know, you would say today family event, and and it was, <clears throat> and 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 sometimes this this family events of cavalry training were kind of old style because they used lances, and yes, they used lances because, well, one one part tradition, second part horsemanship. If you can, uh, you know, fight with your lance from the horse and then then you are a good horseman and they and uh, and they put premium on being a good horseman in in cavalry units um, that however doesn't mean that people that uh, lance was considered like you know uh, war war <laughs> a worthy weapon uh, weapon for modern war they actually withdraw say uh, lances between 1934 uh, and 1937 and some some people took them to combat like but that was like their own volition they 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 wanted to take lands so they took it and we had like one 
one instance I know of of a Polish cavalry in 1939 charging with lances, and but they charged not tanks but other cavalry that detachment and it was like it was a very minor skirmish it was uh, the polish were platoon strong and they were charging about that was 7 8th september i don't know uh, um mazovia near central poland uh, royal forest uh, they, they they were a platoon strong patrol that had lances and charge uh, platoon strong german cavalry patrol and routed them. Uh, Polish suffered one uh, severely injured man, Germans, uh, but I do not have this, have this confirmed according to Polish reports, three casualties. So, you know, very, mi very minor skirmish and, and this German casualty is probably wounded. Um, so, ver very minor skirmish, very unconsequential and this is one time that I know of for sure that Polish cavalry used lances in combat in September 1939. In all, all other instances I know of the charge, uh, Polish uh, cavalry charging they charge with sabers and so why they had sabers as we as we said as i said obvious um, melee fight happened and if you end up in a melee fighting in the second world war uh, you have basically a knife or a bayonet and when i'm saying a knife i mean a bayonet but without a rifle if you uh, and if you fight with bayonet with, with a rifle against saber uh, be there on foot combat or or horse combat. If if the guy you're fighting is on horse, you are even more screwed. Uh, if you don't have ammunition in your chamber, um, because uh, when you're fighting, um, because bayonet uh, rifle with bayonet should be longer with saber, right? But we you don't fighting uh, you don't fight a rifle with bayonet with the you know holding by the buttstock of the rifle. You say. You hold the buttstock of the of the rifle or the grip of the weapon, and the other hand goes near the end of the barrel when you have bayonet. So your reach is about that. <laughs> With saber, it's it's just you know more reach, and saber is 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 much more you know it's designed to be a hand to hand combat weapon, and rifle with 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 bayonet is more of an improvised. Yes, you can fight very effectively, defend it yourself very effectively with rifle, with bayonet. Uh, however, um, if we consider that, you know, there is some German infantryman uh, maybe seeing combat first time, because we're talking September 1939, most of the Germans see combat first time. And if the... And he is standing... Uh, and he has to fight with the Polish cavalryman, who is probably, uh, you know, um, ex-nobility, uh, Polish, you know, um, like, how to say it? Uh, they withdraw all nobility, special nobility status, let's put it that way, in 1918 or 1919, I, d I don't remember exact date, but right after second, first, first World War. Uh, so, but they were still ex-nobility, they were raised in Polish military tr traditions often, and Saber, uh, well, if they were living in, 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 in you know, ex-Polish nobility house, uh, home, family, then they probably trained with Saber, even as fun, you know, when they were five years old. And so, so you pit some German guy, f first time fighting with some, you know, uh, very... Mm, what? Not at him, Pierre Dolling about? Fuck you, man. Fuck you. <laughs> what the hell? Um, no, any, anyhow, I will just, you know. I, I don't want to see the chat right now. So I'll put it right this. Oh, no. Oh, I will see the chat. Never mind. So if you pit uh, some German guy first seeing first seeing fighting uh, against Polish trained uh, cavalryman who uh, played with his saber since he was five, where my money is on Polish guy. Let's let's put it right that. Uh, anyhow. <clears throat> now. 
from where the myth begins of Polish people charging tanks because uh, you know some Polish even uh, considered it to be true for a very long time and there were Polish uh, poets, Polish film, filmmakers that uh, wrote about it as a fact uh, or created you know their movies and showed them and showed their uh, Polish cavalry charging tanks and slashing with sa sabers with tank but slashing saber the tank barrel you, what, what the hell and they consider it and they consider to wait for it they consider it uh, the proof of uh, Polish heroism if if you can believe that because to me it's you know straight up stupidity and um, so why where the myth have have its origins and 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 the origins of the myth are near the village of Krojanty in mm, Pomerania Poland today I think uh, it was it was a small village and uh, fighting around it took place between 1st and 2nd uh, September so right the first day of the war and the Polish units there were quite pressed by um, elements of Guderian's 19th armored corps and like the fighting started around 6 or 7 around 10 a.m. they were uh, there, there were already Polish units with, withdrawing and to facilitate that withdraw, to cover that withdraw uh, Poli uh, detachments from 19th Polish Ulan squadron uh, Pomeranian Ulan squadron were ordered to counterattack, uh, attacking Germans uh, Colonel Kazimierz Mastelasz received this order um, early afternoon i think or about noon uh, it was and the officer the lieutenant delivering that order said it was impossible order and mastelash replied to him that uh, he will show him about uh, something uh, about executing impossible orders uh, so maybe he was cocky according to you know later e events I am about to describe to you uh, you can very well uh, take that that he was cocky he was arrogant maybe I I would I don't think so I think you want you, you want to have your cavalry officers um, aggressive you you want them to be a little a little bit of cocky a little bit of uh, you, you want them aggressive so they can uh, you know seize the opportunity um, to not miss the opportunity to um, attack the enemy or to uh, well just aggressiveness in cavalry officers is usually a good thing and uh, and in in general if you, uh, when today's militaries train their officers um, and and uh, and these are not strictly the defensive stationary units they want them to be ag aggressive like the statistics shows it's it's just proper officer training and Mastelash uh, Mastelash was not uh, was not about to charge straight into into the enemy he actually circled around he 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 took uh, the longer route uh, because he wanted to surprise the germans and he actually um he made it he made it he um he was um undetected by by the germans and he found uh, 76th infantry regiment from i think 20th uh, motorized infantry division of the German armed forces and this uh, part there was a, 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 a battalion from 76th regiment he uh, he encountered this battalion when the Germans were preparing uh, for the night uh, it was about 1800 hours and he uh, after a brief reconnaissance supposedly there was polish reconnaissance i will go back to this polish reconnaissance in a minute uh, supposedly there was reconnaissance after this reconnaissance 
mm, saying the Germans did not uh, put any sentry out. There were no German sentries. Uh, Colonel Mastelaj decided to take a charge. So the Polish charged. He was in charge of two squadrons of Polish cavalry from 19th from the 19th Brigade uh, with some uh, platoons from other from the third and fourth squadrons together about 250 men. They charged and they succeeded. They routed German battalion almost immediately. Uh, Polish losses at that point uh, after a few minutes of fighting and slashing sabers and, and shooting uh, sidearm pistols from close direction they they killed about nine and and wounded uh, about a dozen Germans according to German sources. Polish sources uh, put the, vict the victims of, uh, German victims of, of this attack much higher but I ch in this case I choose to believe German sources and then Mastelaj uh, choose to uh, follow German uh, routed unit with pursuit and during this pursuit he was jumped uh, from the forest by German uh, armored cars from probably uh, 20 reconnaissance battalion uh, there were either four wheeled or eight wheeled um, vehicles uh, armed with machine guns and if there were eight wheeled vehicles they probably had 20 millimeter cannons uh, we had po from polish uh, sources we know that uh, mastelaj uh, charge like after routing the enemy and pursuing the routed enemy uh, he fall under fire of machine guns and grenade launchers uh, I would scratch that grenade launchers and I think that was not grenade launchers actually but uh, 20 millimeter cannons from German transports. However, um, under fire the, the charge was... It, it was a minor carnage. It, it was a minor carnage. Uh, the commander of one of the squadrons got killed uh, with a with few of the with few other of the Polish cavalrymen. Mastelaj tried to save his comrade, this lieutenant just, that just, just got wounded and reportedly he got, he got gunned down in that attempt. And the Pol rest of the Polish cavalry immediately retreated, uh, jumped back from the enemy and uh, returned. So, uh, and left about 25 dead a number of wounded, part, part of them fell into the German hands, hands most of them retreated, uh, was about 40. Uh, so, you know, tactically, bad, bad situation. I would, I am, I am kind of hesitating to call a Mastelage, uh, uh, to call, to call this move by Mastelage, um, pursuing the enemy a, a mistake. Uh, because I don't know whether the Polish reconnaissance before the battle uh, was actually a proper one, uh, or maybe this, you know, German uh, armored transport with machine guns arrived just, you know, just in that time, very fortunately uh, for the Germans. <clears throat> so I don't know, but uh, anyway, a lot of Polish call it a draw this encounter. Uh, why a draw? Well, operational uh, command that Mastelaj get at the beginning was to delay German advance and he certainly achieved that. Uh, that was first day of the war, German unit was routed very quickly and even other uh, German units in the area were, were starting to, you know, to prepare to defend against Polish cavalry charges. Uh, in one of, even Heinz Guderian uh, wrote it about um, about it in his memoirs. Uh, he and he wrote about it as it was like first day of the war was was a lot of panic among German among German ranks and Polish and this Pol Mastelaj charge at Kryanty um, was important part of that. Um, this German panic during first day of the war. Uh, Guderian obviously good commander as he was, he stemmed the panic and he um, pulled his forces into line, uh, but German advance was halted for several hours. So Mastelaj uh, certainly 
succeeded in doing so and and the forces he was covering uh, managed to retreat after um, behind the river uh, Berda that was a uh, near river uh, that was uh, before the war the plan um, the plan from before the war assumed it was be uh, positions behind that river will be a secondary position a um, secondary defensive position for polish forces in that area that would be one infantry battalion and and chersk operational group uh, with two regiments i think anyway <coughs> uh, so some charge surprised P polish surprised the enemy Ge then germans surprised the polish killed most killed more of them than than, than they uh, lose men by themselves uh, and in this in these losses i would i would uh, point you that um, germans have more had more manpower they could afford mistakes when they lose a dozen men in uh, polish could not afford mistakes when they lose a few dozens men and and these were men from one from the uh, from the unit that was supposed and that was supposed to be elite of the polish armed forces we just couldn't take that kind of traits especially that early in the war so i would put a cryante charge more of a set at, at the more of the setback uh, more of a defeat than a draw but that's me you are welcome to disagree um but you know there were no tags so why the hell? Why the hell you are talking to us about charging tanks? Well, well, there was no charging tanks, actually. Uh, however, the next day, S September 2nd, a few German war correspondents and two Italian war correspondents, among them Mr. Inigo Montanelli, uh, were shown the battlefield. On this battlefield, there, 2nd second, uh, second of September, there were German tanks. And the German tanks... Uh, and the Germans said to these war correspondents that Polish cavalry actually charged those tanks. A lie. A lie that was then repeated by all of these war correspondents, all as far as, as I can say. Uh, Inigo Montanelli especially, he wrote that he actually witnessed the charge. He described the charge and the brave Polish cavalrymen that heroically with lances and sabers, there were no lances, charged tanks, there were no tanks, um, and there were no Inigo Montanelli in the first place. But he wrote what he wrote. He then sent this article to his Gazette, it was published and then myth was created and then repeated many many times by germans by soviets by polish even to you know to portray our countrymen that yeah maybe we're unprepared for war but we were valiant we were brave we charged tanks with lances a moment of silence for them Inigo Montanelli was confronted by Radosław Sikorski that you may if you are Polish today you probably know him he was um, quite a few years ago he was still a defense minister uh, um, a foreign affairs minister in Polish government in 1998 uh, Ra Radosław Sikorski tracked down Inigo Montanelli and confronted him about this article and Inigo Montanelli came true he said he lied uh, so there is that. Um, also in the 1960s and 1970s there was a colonel with Polish armed forces Zbigniew Zawuski uh, who took up upon himself to, uh, to, you know, to uncover the truth because he didn't believe and, there, and, and he also knew some of the older cavalry uh, officers from Polish armed forces that uh, and a lot of people were saying like yeah there were polish cavalry charge tanks but there were still people who knew better that polish cavalry didn't charge tanks and zawuski was convinced about that uh, and he uh, took upon himself to change that outlook on polish historiography at least in poland 
and he succeeded so cheers to that guy uh, in the in the 60s and uh, and 70s uh, he compiled a lot of evidence he uh, uh, about polish charging and these battles when the polish reportedly judged tanks and he uncovered nothing of that uh, his his research his research sparked one of the greatest debate about historiography in poland during the, uh, in the after war um, or, or, or in the period before, uh, between end of the war and 1990. So, and even though there were a lot of people and Polish still, uh, well, in the 1990s, we pretty much knew that we didn't charge tanks. Uh, this lie is still perpetuated somewhere i can i can you know i can see them uh, i can see this lie um somewhere on the social media from time to time um, and i wanted to you know explain that also this uh, this this episode uh was aired because and this you know this topic was picked because of bartek uh, who su who su suggested it to me uh, to talk a little bit more about Polish cavalry in 1939. I will certainly talk about Polish cavalry more. Uh, I will certainly talk about September 1939 more, but uh, not in the next episode. Next episode will be something different today. Uh, well, I also wanted to you know to do, uh, to debunk this. I wanted to talk about little about Polish cavalry because well, I am local Polish dude. What can I say? I just start with I just started with something Polish. Uh, later, will you will get something other? I uh, I don't know yet what. Probably something ancient history, or maybe Renaissance history and siege of Malta. We'll see. Uh, you can uh, you can poke me anytime. You can leave comment. Please subscribe. Please uh, you know visit my Patreon site. That is Patreon.com/slash/historyoverbeer. No spaces. And if you want to suggest a topic like Bartek did with this topic, with this topic, yep, you can do this. Now, um, so that I think was the final word. How long we took? How long we took to do that? 40 minutes. Well, I think that's quite enough for the first time. So thank you. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for sh scoping up for my channel. And sorry, dude, Mr. Alexi, for re reacting in chat. Well, it's it's the first time for me. I will probably not pay attention much to, to such chat cockiness next time. But any, anyhow... If you want to ask a question during the show, the chat is right there, and you should, because I enjoy questions. Even if you, even if you want to, you know, to hit me with with, with something I don't know. I, a lot of cases, I, I I enjoy these parts the most because I'm learning also. So, it will be all for now. Cheers, folks.